And while Milt was singing, Johannes was signing. It was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. And it was such an emotional time. And, and for God to have you come up here and sing this song. And um, when I have the opportunity to share the word of God. But then, not only that, let me just share with you. And I'm not, you'll see this. How this song that he just sang connects to the very core of this message today. I didn't plan it. I didn't even think about it. I didn't call him and say, hey, Mel, what are you singing? I didn't, it's not the way it worked out. It's the way the Spirit of God worked out. It's the way he always works out when we allow him. And so I hope and pray that uh, you guys understand and see and just really allow God to speak to you today and, and just use the entire time of worship. Because we just had the opportunity to worship and praise. Now it's the opportunity to worship in word. And uh, you put all that together uh, worship does something that brings about a life-changing moment. And I hope and pray that you all will see that and apply it to your lives. And, you know, as you've heard, our pastor is on some R&R. &R. It, it, it's deserved. He's a man that has put everything. He's put all of his eggs in one basket. He's put everything he had into the kingdom of God. And you happen to be the place that, he, that God landed him and placed him. He loves each and every one of you. I I, you know, I've learned from men how to teach the Word of God, but it's that man that taught me how to lead, and he taught me how to love, and he taught me how to invest, and he knows he's a shepherd, and, uh, and as a shepherd gets beat up every now and then, that's life, right? So this, this R&R &R is good for him, so we just need to keep him in our prayers, and uh, I just also would like to say for us, thank you. I know I've said it many times, um, but you know, we've been back now for a few months, and uh, there's much happening still in Zambia. We're getting report all the time of things that are taking place. Ministry is still happening. And the beautiful thing is, is, Bobby, when you and I went, God was already there, right? We didn't take God with us. God was there, and God is still working there. And so um, thank you for your prayers. I was talking with a brother. Um, I can tell you this, you know, with Tammy and I, and we're planning on going back in June, and... Um, to, to, you know, have some closure, if you would, um, see some friends and family, but also to maybe a guy would allow us to get some personal items to bring, us, bring them back with us. But, uh, but I will tell you, we're still very somber. It's very somber for us to be here. Not, and, and that doesn't take away from knowing what God has for us. I have no doubt that this is where God wants us to be. If I could give you the entire puzzle, you would see it. In that line, in that direction, God has brought us. But it's still a very somber moment. And, and I was talking to a friend and emailed him, just sharing with him my heart. And he said, you know, he said, uh, a missionary coming off the field is, is, is like a, a soldier that is coming off from battle. He said, a soldier that comes off from battle physically, it takes about a year for them to get readjusted and acclimated into civilian life or, or into just life in general. And he said, but for us, it's spiritual. And I'm like, wow, that really makes sense. And so as we continue to plug along and move forward in the ministry, you know, um, and again, I'm not trying to make this about me at all or us. I just want to, I'm saying thank you to the church, you know, and we never would have planned for me coming on staff here. But, you know, April 1st is April 1st. For all I know, I could walk in and April Fool's, Brian, we're just kidding, you know. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, but hey, if that's the case, that's the case, you know, Amen. And so uh, we'll do whatever God wants us to do. But we're, we're so thankful to be here um, and to be a part of you, family. You're our family. And so um, with that, oh, let me also just share, just so you know, just a little bit. Um, I Actually, I forgot to share this in the first service, that the ministry is still happening. Um, you know, a ministry that Tammy started over there, Buckets for Moms, is still going strong. And just recently, last uh, Tuesday, Krista was able to go down and minister to the women at Mushini Health Clinic, and there were some ladies that came to know Christ as their Savior. Um, the, the, Bi the Bible Institute still moving. Alex has had the opportunity to minister, and he baptized many of the students from the school next to us. And just yesterday, he had the opportunity to go into Luancha's United Football Club, which is a professional football team, and he had the opportunity to uh, to lead many of them to Christ. Now they're asking him to come back on a sa every Saturday to minister, you know, and he's a former professional football player. So, and when I say football, I mean soccer, obviously, but, but you know, so the ministry's still moving. Lives are being changed. Souls are being won to Christ. Uh, so people are committing their lives to baptism. The ministry's still going. 
And that's just God's handprint, his thumbprint saying, yes, I, I approve what's taking place. So, so, but if you look at today's uh, title, Value of the Destination, now just take that title and apply it to what Milt's saying, okay? And that could be in the message, you know? It really could be. And, and I think you'll understand when we connect all of this together at the end of the message what I mean by this. But when we start this message today, uh, I'm going to start read by reading a verse that's not up there on the screen for you. I just want you to listen to it. It's in Matthew chapter 26, verse 39. We're going to read this, we'll pray, and then we'll get into the message. And it says, um, in this verse it says, And he went a little further, and he fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Father, we come before you. And we thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for what he was willing to go through for us. He went a little further. And sometimes it's so difficult because of what we see before us. We, we might be fearful. We might be scared. I know that the Lord asked this cup to pass before him. I don't think he was fearful of death. He was not fearful of that at all. He was just asking, Father, if there's any other way. He knew the temptations that would be before him. But he submitted himself to you and said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. And I just pray today for the congregation that's listening. If there's someone here that does not know Jesus as their Savior, that they will take that same position of humility and submit themselves into a place of salvation and enter into the kingdom of God and enter into the family by trusting in Jesus as their personal Savior. And for the body of Christ, my prayer, Lord God, is that you might challenge us in our hearts to go a little further. So thank you, Father. We love you and praise you, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So what is the value of the destination? Well, Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane at this time. We know, most of us know, if you know the scriptures, that it was at this time Jesus is getting ready to be betrayed by one of the twelve, by Judas. So he calls the twelve to come with him to go pray. And it says, and he went a little further, and he prayed, and he prayed this prayer. He went back, and he found his disciples sleeping, you know. And he, 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 challenged, he, he, he rebuked them and said, hey, could you just not be awake? Could you not just pray with me one hour? And he went back, and he prayed again. And he did this three times. Each time, he went a little further, a little further for his father. And, you know, he even went further after that, because after this, we know Judas came in, and Judas betrayed him. And then from there he went a little further to Caiaphas. And then from there he went a little further to Pilate. And from there to Herod and back to Pilate. And ultimately he went a little further for you and I to the cross. But it didn't stop there because according to the authority of Scripture, he's now sitting at the right hand of the Father. Amen? But he went a little further for us. And so I have a question for you. Church, how far are you willing to go? How far are you willing to go for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? We see how far Jesus went. How far are you willing to go? And I think there are many, questions, many answers to this question. As I was um, thinking about them, there was two that, that popped in my head. And one of them was this. It depends upon the value placed on the destination. You're only going to go as far as the value you place on that destination. You're not going to go any further. You're going to count the cost, you're going to see if it's worth going, and then you're going to place a value on it, and you're going to go or not. Also, some of you might say, it depends on the unknown obstacles that a person may face on the journey. So you might have a desire for this destination, but yet you might say the cost is too high. Too many obstacles, too many, too many battles before me. You know, oftentimes God doesn't show us the cost 100%, because he knows we will say no. So he doesn't give us the actual obstacles till we're in the midst of it. But overall, we try to plan, we try to figure out and what we can. So how far are you willing to go? You know, I'm going to share with you a story that happened back in 2018. This is a true story. In the country of Thailand, there was a soccer team of 18 youth and a head coach that went missing. You guys might have remembered watching this on TV. It was all over the news. And it says here... Um, they went missing. And a search effort of more than 1,000 people came together in order to find them. They were searching. They knew where they had gone. They, they knew, they think that they knew where they had gone. And they started searching these caverns and caves. 
And uh, what had happened was they were eventually found by two British di divers, and they were found trapped in a cave. Altogether, 18 divers came together in order to save the soccer team and the coach. The mission became very dangerous due to the rains and the rising of the water throughout the tunnels of the cave. So what had happened is, is when they finally got back there, the waters started rising through the caverns, and it cut their, their, their exit off. They could not get out. And so that's exactly what happened. When they found them, it says here it took six hours to reach the trap team and another five hours to return with the fast-moving currents. And they didn't do them all at one time. It was like three or four at a time. Okay? In the end, the entire soccer team and the coach were rescued, but sadly, retired Navy SEAL Petty Officer Samarn Kunin lost his life in an attempt in saving the youth. So this is a true story. There's something that happened, and, um, and tragically, a man lost his life. But the, but the soccer team was saved, and everyone rejoiced when they were coming out. So my question here is this. What is it that would bring total strangers together and risk their lives in a situation like this? What is it? What would actually drive someone to do this? And here's what it comes down to. They placed a value on the lives of the team and on the coach. They placed value on life, okay? They were willing to go a little further in order to save these people. They began with an end in mind, and then they built a plan. See, they had a, a destination. They knew what they wanted to do. They knew that there was a goal, but then they had to build a plan. And I think that I saw in the, in the article, there were three plans they formulated. Two of them didn't work, and one of them uh, was very risky, but obviously it did work. So they understood the obstacles, and they understood it could cost them their lives, yet the value of life outweighed the risks. See, we live in a world today where I'm afraid to say I don't think it's that way. The value is on something other than that which God puts value upon. So again, I ask you, church, how far are we willing to go? What are we willing to give up? Are we willing to go the distance? And in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we're going to go through the whole passage that we see here. And this is not about the life of Paul and how he was beaten and his shipwrecks. But we do see in this passage where he placed value and what it cost him and what he was willing to do. So what we see here in this passage is that Paul placed value on the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's where he placed value. See, now the gospel is more than just salvation. I know you've heard that from this pulpit, because I've said it from this pulpit, and I know you've heard it from Brownie and Bob. I, I know you have. It's more than just salvation. Flip over, if you have your Bibles or your pad, go to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 real quick. Verses 1 through 4 give you the definition of, of the gospel, the good news, that Jesus Christ died, he was buried, and he rose again, right? But verse 1 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you received, and wherein you stand. See, the gospel isn't something that you just receive. It's something you live in. Yes, you receive the gospel for salvation. That's what saves your soul. But when it comes to sanctification and growth, that's where you live. That's your life. We, should, as Christians, should know no other. So you know what the good news is? The good news is if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, you can be saved. But the good news goes past that, too. Not only can you be saved, but you can grow in Jesus Christ. You can be conformed to the image of Jesus. And so value, Paul placed value on the gospel of Jesus Christ. So because of this value, Paul adjusted his life to the ministry. He adjusted his life for the ministry. So we're going to read some verses here. I'll talk about the verses, and, and, and we'll break it down some. Look at... Uh, chapter 9, verse 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 4 and hit a few other verses. Paul says here, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? He's saying, Did I not pour my life into you? Even the next verse he says here, If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of my apostleship are ye in the Lord. He says, you are the proof of the calling in my life. 
The authority that God has given me, you are the proof. You're standing living proof because of it. He said, my answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about sister and wife? You jump over to verse 6, he says, Or I only and Barnabas, have not we power to forbear working? You're going to see that word power throughout this passage. And that word can also be defined as authority. That's what he's saying here. Have we not the power? Have not we been given authority? You know, all power was given to Jesus Christ. What is it? All authority was given to him. And now God has transferred over to Paul some authority and some power. And so we see here, jump down to verse 11. He says, If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it great thing if we shall reap unto you carnal things? He's saying, if we're pouring our life into you, is it such a bad thing that you're providing for us financially and to be able to provide food for our families and, and, and a roof over our head and clothing on our, on our bodies as we travel to be able to eat? He says here in verse 12, And if others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? There are others that came into the church that was claiming apostolic type of power and authority, and they were turning carnal or, or temporal things over to them, that which that would provide for their daily needs. He says, if you're doing it for them, why aren't you doing it for us, right? And then he says here, nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. He's saying, you know what? We didn't ask of you of this. Because we knew what it was going to do. It would actually hinder the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 14. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. See, if we're preaching it, this is our whole lives. If we're going to give the gospel to you, then we're going to live and be provided within the gospel. And the means that God is going to provide is through the church body. That's the way he has ordained it. Okay? But I have used none of these things. It's very important. Neither have I written this, the, written these things. He's saying, I didn't abuse this. I didn't take from you. I didn't take one dime from you. And I'm not writing you this epistle so I can get something from you. You see, he's actually recognizing and seeing here the state of this church and where they stand. And one thing he wants to make sure is adjust his life to the ministry that God has given him. He didn't use any. It says that it should be so done unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glory in void. Verse 16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. See, he is showing you right now where his priority is. It's not on the physical. It's on the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's where his focus is. Verse 17, for if I do this willingly, I have a reward. See, there's a reward he knows that if he does this with the right heart attitude, he's going to get something in the end. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Barely that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge. See, there were probably some, it sounds like, coming in, preaching the gospel, but making people pay for it. If you want to hear what I have to say, you've got to give me money. And he says right here, this is free without charge. I can't charge somebody to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says that I abuse not my power, my authority in the gospel. There are many people out there today that are abusing their so-called power to become rich off the gospel of Jesus Christ. But yet before he's saying, hey, I'm not trying to become rich. But there is a place where I can be provided for as I'm in the gospel. And so when we stop at this point, we start seeing that he was willing to adjust his life for the ministry. Here at Corinth, he chose not to accept financial support. He chose not to receive gifts from this church. Why? Because he understood their spiritual maturity. See, there were some that were in the church that were even questioning Paul's authority. Question his motivation. You find that over in verse 2 or verse 3 where he says, uh, my answer to them that examine me. There are people that are putting him up for examination, questioning his leadership and what God has called him to do. See, it's interesting, though, because when you go over to the book of Philippians, it's opposite. Over in chapter 4, he's talking about, he's praising them for the gift that they sent. 
in order for him to continue the ministry. And he was saying, I'm abounding because of this. Thank you so much. But the church of Corinth, he said, absolutely not. I'm not going to receive. So why is that? It's because they were both on di different spiritual levels. He understood he could praise Philippi for what they did, and it wasn't going to cause them to stumble. But with the church of Corinth, if he received, it would have caused them to stumble. There then, it would have blamed the ministry in a negative way. You see? He was willing to adjust his life. They were both at different spiritual places, both churches. See, the church of Corinth, it was a carnal church. Everything that he had been taught in just three to six years had gone down. No longer were they doing what they were supposed to be doing. It was all about what they could receive. And now this church of rebuke has taken place, and Paul's having to rebuke them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 3 through 4, it says this, giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. See, he didn't want to give offense into anything that he did. He was, he was so focused on making sure that he had a good testimony and that Jesus Christ, that he represented Jesus well. And so he's saying that there will be no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. But in all things, approving ourselves as ministers of God, in all things, he wanted to prove and that everything he did was approving unto God of his authority that had been given to him, you see. In much patience, in afflictions, in necessity, you see, there's a, a long list of these obstacles that he had gone through, but none of this caused him to trip, trip up. He wanted to make sure that the ministry would not be blamed. See, Paul was not worried. You have to understand, Paul was not worried about being given anything from anybody. Because he had learned how to live and walk by faith. Over in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, he says this, Not that I speak in respect of one, for I learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. He learned how to be placed into a, a, the area of God's provision. And here's the thing. He was more concerned about Corinth's growth spiritually than he was for himself provisionally. And so because of that, he did not want to become a stumbling block to this church. He was not given any one reason to ever point a finger at him. Paul was blameless at this. So here's our challenge, church. Here's our challenge with this point. What are you willing to say no to in order that the ministry be not blamed? You see, right now, we live in an age and an era of liberality within the church. And you know, there's a lot of people that venture out on their liberality. But I've heard testimonies of lost people saying, why do I want to become part of them when they do the exact same thing I do? There's no difference between us and them, so why would I want to go in and become part of the church? You see, we have to make sure, church, that our life is blameless before a living God and before a lost world, and that the ministry is not blamed. See, that's how much the gospel meant to him. That's how much value he placed on the gospel, that he was willing to make some adjustments. So what are you willing to say no to in order that the ministry be not blamed? But he was also willing to make an adjustment in his life for the lives of others. See, it wasn't just the ministry, but it was the lives of others. Look here at verses 19. We're going to read 19 through verse 22. He says, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And under the Jews became I as a Jew, that I might gain the Jew. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law, as without the law, being not without the law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. You see, he was willing to adjust his life for others. And in this passage, he says, you know, I'm free from all men. I'm free. I've been made free from all men. But he still made himself a servant to all men. He was willing to place himself under that subjection because of what Jesus Christ did. And I think it's interesting, though, we kind of go backwards because Paul was, in his mind, he was free. But he realized through that road to Damascus, when he met Jesus Christ, 
But he wasn't free. He was bound by sin. And when he met Jesus and he received Jesus as his Savior, he was free from that sin and he was given liberality. But according to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, he says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. So he was set free. But once he realized what he was set free from, he placed himself back into bondage under Jesus Christ. He said, you set me to be free, I'll serve you the rest of my life. And that's exactly what he did. That's exactly what he did. So you think about a prisoner today in prison. What do they do? Well, they do exactly what the warden tells them to do, right? They, they, they've got a schedule. They've got to be up on time. They've got to shower sometime. They've got, to, they've got their downtime, but it's the schedule that the warden has put together. Well, we don't have a warden. We have a guide. But if we place ourselves in prison unto the Lord, what do we do? We do what our God tells us to do. So what does he tell us to do? Well, 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 16 says this. As free, even Peter understands this, this doctrine and this teaching. He says, as free and not using your liberality for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. He says, you know what? Don't use the freedom that God has given you, the liberty, to deceive, to, to destroy, to get from others so you can be selfish and obtain. You see, the reason why God set us free is so we will do what we're, what we're supposed to do. Not to do what we want to do, but to do what we ought to do. That's why we were set free. And yet, you know what? Jesus Christ, our God, he gives us the freedom. We can either... Choose to follow him or choose to follow this world. But right here, Peter's telling us, and he's connecting your liberality to service. Use your liberty to serve. And then in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, Paul says pretty much the same thing. He says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty for the occasion of the flesh, but by love serve one another. You want to know why God gave you liberty? So you'll serve God and you'll serve people. That's why. And if you are not serving God and you're not serving your people, uh, other people, then you are misusing the liberality that God has given you. Because think about it this, church. If you're not serving God and serving others, who are you serving? Yourself. And so you're using that liberty for malice. You're using that liberty for the occasion of the flesh. But you know what Paul did? He submitted himself. He put himself back under the place of servanthood of God and other people. Even though he was free, he saw himself indebted unto man because of the message that he had been given, the message that was shared unto him. Romans chapter 1, verse 14. Here's what it says. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. You know what he's saying? He's saying, I'm a debtor both to the civilized and the uncivilized. To those that understand and those that don't understand. I'm in debt to them. I owe them my life. I've heard testimony before. Um, I, I remember hearing it a long time ago on the radio where a lost person was saying, I, I could never be a Christian. And he said, here's why. He goes, because if what you're saying is true, let's, what you're saying is true is that if anybody does not trust in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, that they are going to be separated from a God for all of eternity in hell and in the lake of fire, in torment, night and day, gnashing of teeth, never, one moment of rest. If that's what you're saying, church, if that was true, and I believed it, I would be out telling everybody I could because because of the torment, because of the destination of these people. He said, but I don't see the church out doing it. So if it's not important to them, how real can it really be? And I say this to my shame. I'm saying this to my conviction. That's our responsibility. That's the message that we've been given. And if Paul was in debt to people, why should we be any less? See, we should place ourselves back in debt. We owe it to others to share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Someone shared it to us. It's our responsibility to share it with others. That was Paul's attitude. He adjusted his life in a way where he could fit into any situation. 
and make an eternal difference in the lives that he came in contact with. You know, um, in baseball, there's, there's going to be some baseball illustrations today, maybe some more, because of the passage, okay? And, uh, but you know, uh, in baseball, they have what they call a super utility guy, right? They have a utility guy, but then they have the next step, super utility guy. And the utility player on the baseball team, he's good enough to be in the majors. And he's so good, he can play every position. So if they need a right fielder, he can step in. If they need a left fielder, if they, if, if they need a shortstop, the only positions they normally don't play is catcher and pitcher, right? But, but then there's the super utility player. And that guy is even on a higher level because he's able to get involved and to play any position on the field. See, that's what Paul was. He was a super utility player, and if there was another term above that, I would give that term to him, okay? Because Paul was on a different level than all of us, right? He was. But here's what he says. To the Jew became I a Jew. He was Jewish. He was a Pharisee. He knew the law. He knew it up and down, backwards, forwards. That's what he used to reach people. But when it came time to reach them, he reached them at their level. He reached them where they were, and he would walk with them as far as he could walk with them. And where he would stop is when their culture and tradition would violate the truth in the scriptures. That's when he would stop. And then he would see some over here, a Gentile, and, and he would walk with them, and, and he would walk with them as far as he could go, sharing the gospel. He didn't pretend to be above them. He didn't be, pretend to be below them. He got on the same level as them to be able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, that's where he was willing to adjust his life. He was willing, you know, I can tell you, and there's some missionaries in the room, and I learned this, and it's so true. To be a missionary in the foreign land, you can't expect them to adjust their lives to you. You have to adjust your life to them. You have to know their thoughts and try to learn as best as you can to be able to minister to them. Amen? That's exactly how Paul the Apostle was. So the gospel meant so much to him, he was willing to adjust his life to the lives of others. So here's our challenge, church. Whose lives are you making an adjustment for in order to make an eternal difference? Whose life? Is it your co-workers? Is it your family? Are, are you willing to make an adjustment? Maybe, maybe somebody's asked you to come up on the field, but I don't like sports. I don't like that. That's okay, because it's not about sports. It's about the souls that are up there. Maybe you might make an adjustment in your life just to go up there on a Saturday and make a difference. Maybe you don't like sports. Maybe you don't like baseball or, or Chiefs or, or whatever. But in order to get in the life of somebody, you're willing to adjust your life to become as them so you can earn the right and build a relationship to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, that's what Paul did. Who in your life, and I hope and pray right now as we're speaking, someone's popping into your mind, and my prayer today is that you're going to make a commitment to make that adjustment for them. So make an adjustment for the ministry. That's how important it was to Paul. Make an adjustment for the lives of others. But he also placed his value on something else. When you read through this scripture, he also placed the value on the incorruptible pride. Do you guys realize it's okay to covet? okay to covet? The Bible says not to covet. No, no, the Bible says not to covet the things of this world, but it's okay to covet and desire the things that are eternal, to covet those spiritual things. And Paul is telling us in here, in the scriptures, that we need to place a value on this incorruptible prize. We have something to look forward to, church. We have something to strive for, but we have to see this something with God's eyes and not our own. So when you look at this passage here, verse 24 through 25, it says, Know you not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. It's telling us to go after it. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. So he's telling us, he's given us permission by the authority of Scripture to run after this prize, to go get it. Don't let anything hold you back. Now, there's a word in here that we're going to focus on for a second, and it's the word of temperance, okay? Because he's using a physical analogy here, and he's saying they're temperate in all things, and that is true. 
But I want to tell you, temperance for the world is different between the temperance of the church. Because, see, the temperance of the world is self-control. It's self-control. It's, it's what you do to control your life in order to obtain something. And I think we can all understand this. Serious athletes are self-disciplined when it comes to reaching their goals. Now, Paul uses running, but I'm going to use baseball or whatever else illustration when it comes to sports. Because these men and women who have placed themselves in a high level, they're trying to achieve this excellence. They put their lives in a place to where they're going to be self-controlling, to make sure that they are the, the best physical sheep, shape that they can possibly be. And so, like, um, I was here listening years ago uh, to sports talk and to on a station around here, and um, I, I heard the guy talking. He's saying, you know, there's, there's three goals that a minor leaguer has to get into the majors. There's three goals, and here they are. One is to get there. Two is to stay there. And three is to get paid there. You know, that's what they want. But they've got to make it to the first before they can get to the last, Right? And so right now, we have spring training as we talk. As we speak right now, there's spring training. And the veterans, they just want this time to be over with. The guys who know they have a position, they just want it to be over. But these young players that get the chance to play with these big leaguers, they want it to last because they know they're getting ready to be sent down, right? But what do they do? They strive. Every day, they're working on their pitches. They're, they're, they're strengthening their strengths and they're strengthening their weaknesses to make sure that they are on the excellent level they can possibly be. I was listening to a sports talk, and, you know, Mike Boddicker. Mike Boddicker played with, with Bobby. They played on the same team together. And I, and I heard him talk, and he said years ago when it comes to, this was years ago, when it came to spring training, most of the players would come out of shape. And they would use that month in order to get in baseball shape because they didn't make the same kind of money they did back then. So they would have to leave and, and, and when the season was over, they'd get a job, right, and have to pay the bills. But once the season started back up, they'd come back together, get in shape for that month, and then go on to the majors. Well, it's not that way anymore because there's such crazy money out there. $300 million contracts, $400 million contracts. So here's the thing. I was talking to my boy. He was telling me he heard of an NFL player that spends like over hundreds of thousands of dollars every year just to pamper himself just to take care of this vessel when it comes to how he eats and how he trains and what he does. Why? Because he's striving for that corruptible crown. He wants that prestigious Lombardi trophy, right? The World Series trophy, people are searching for that, something that's corruptible. But they put themselves in a place of self-discipline in order to achieve that level. Now take everything I said and flip it to the spiritual life that you and I have been called to. Ha See, here's the thing. Temperance is self-disciplined by the lost, but for us, it's not self-discipline. It's God control. It's, it's God discipline in our lives. That's what it is. And when you look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23, it says here, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such there is no law. So I think it's interesting. Remember, the moment you got saved, you received one fruit that had nine parts. It doesn't say the fruits of the Spirit. It says the fruit of the Spirit. It's singular. You receive one fruit that has nine separate parts, and it manifests itself out of you, depending on if you're walking in the Spirit or not, right? But I want you to think about the very last piece. The very last piece is temperance. See, it all culminates down to this last piece. What is temperance? It's God control. It's when you're allowing God to control your life. So think about it. If you don't, you can't have love, you can't have true joy, you can't have peace unless God is controlling your life. So all these fruit work down to this last one of temperance. That's how important it is. See, here's it, here it is, church. We live in a sphere of faith, or we're supposed to. When you receive Jesus as your Savior, for by grace are you saved through faith. The moment through faith you trusted in Jesus, you entered into a relationship. And now we are to live by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and died for us, right? So that means we're never to step out of this sphere of faith. 
Our whole life takes place. And while you're in this sphere of faith, guess what? God is controlling you. Because your mind is right, your heart is right, your life is right. You're focused on the eternal things. But so many times we step outside of that bubble and we're out here now. Now, guess what? There's no guarantees except for your salvation. That you'll never lose. But now you're wondering why everything's falling apart because guess what? No longer are you under God control, you're under self-control. And guess what? We cannot live up to our own standards, right? So we're going to fail. So that you have to get back into this, this sphere of faith and live there and not get out. You repent, you ask forgiveness, and then God picks you up, dusts you off, and you start moving from that point. See, this is how it works in our life. We allow God to work in our lives so that we can obtain this incorruptible crown. You, it's okay to look at the final destination and then work towards it, right? He says here in verse 27, he says, But I keep my body and bring it under subjection. If he does not do this, if he does not bring his body into subjection, allow God to control him, and according to verse 26, he says he will be like one that beats the air. You know, and I don't know if this is true, another analogy of sports. I've been told that in boxing, that if you put everything you have into a punch and you miss, that takes away a lot of energy compared to if you, if you made contact. And that's what this is like. He's saying it's just like one beat in the air. In other words, what he's saying, it's a person that's going through the motions and not making any progress. So much of the church, this is where we're at. We, we're going through the motions. We come to church. We might have like what, what Brownie said last week, a five-minute devotion, which leads to a five-minute de uh, devotional life. We might be doing those things, but we are not progressing. We're in the same spot that we were. See, it, only, it takes God control, not self-control. He also says this in verse 27. He says, um, let's go down here, the last half of that. He says, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So he's saying, I'm doing this. I'm bringing myself into subjection. Because if I preach to others and I'm not doing that, I'm making myself a hypocrite. See, church, we can't be a hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is what pushes people away. So Paul, he placed a value on this prize, and that value was a life of discipline. Are we living that life of discipline, and it's God control? So what's our challenge, church? Here's our challenge. What do you do? What do you value enough in your life that drives you to a place of temperance, of God controlling your life? What is it in your life that you're placing there that's allowing you to do so? Are you allowing God to control you? Or are you still trying to depend upon yourself in order to fix things? It's not going to work that way. You have to place a value on the discipline of God in your life. And then this last point, you've got to value must drive us to a place of preparation. We've got to be at a place of preparation. When you put this whole message together, everything that we've just talked about comes down to a life of preparation. Adjusting. When Paul adjusted his life for the ministry... He had the discernment to say no to more and yes to less. He understood he did not want to be a stumbling block to them, so he said no to them. He could only do this through preparations of spiritual growth. He was adjusting his life to be all men to all things. Being a prisoner of the Lord and an indebted unto man takes preparations, and those preparations will lead you to a place of spiritual maturity. And like what we just talked about, adjusting to a life of God discipline, bringing your body to a place of subjection, focusing on the incorruptible prize that can only take place in the preparations that lead to spiritual maturity. See, it, it takes preparations. Paul the Apostle, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 11 and 12, we've already gone through this verse with our pastor. But this is what it says. It says, um, Paul went through a time of discipleship. He had to go through a time of preparation. From the time he got saved, the time he got on the mission field was about 14 years, 12 to 14. So there was a time of preparation. And, and, and in this verse it says, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. The gospel that came to him, man didn't teach it to him. He said, For neither I received it of man, neither was I taught of it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
And like even in this same passage in 1 Corinthians 9, 1, he says, Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? See, Paul had an encounter with God, and you know what he did? He went through a time of discipleship. He went through a time where Jesus Christ gave him and poured into his life everything for him to take unto the world. But you know what? He had a second discipler, and his name was Barnabas. When nobody was willing to take Paul under his, his wing, Barnabas stepped up and said, I'll do it. And they went together. You see, there came a time of preparations where he was willing to put himself in a place to learn and to grow. So what is our responsibility, church? What's your responsibility? Our responsibility is this, to win them, to teach them, to train them, and to send them. That's our responsibility. This is the process that God has ordained for the local church to work through. Win them, teach them, train them, send them. Now, that's, it can get very complex, but that's a very simple process if, I, if you look at it, right? But here's the thing. What I have noticed throughout the years I've been saved, most believers, they, here's where they get held up. They get held up at the training point. They get held up at training. Yes, they'll, they'll get saved and trust in Christ, and they'll come to church and sit, but when it comes time to get involved and really to learn how to do something and to get out and practice your faith life, many are afraid to do so. Maybe the destination isn't as valuable. Maybe they're scared of the obstacles, you see. So where are you in the life of preparations for the next step? See, this is our challenge. Maybe you're here today, you need to be one to Jesus. Well, I'm here to tell you, I've got good news. All you've got to do today is place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He will save your soul. You will become a child of God, and you will forever be with the Lord. But I'm here to tell you, too, he wants you to grow in him just as a baby grows. So some of you need to begin here at the wind. But then some of you need to be taught. Maybe today you, you, you need to be taught the word of God and someone to sit down and teach you. Some of you here today may need to be trained. Take that next step and go a little bit further. And then some of you might be called to be sent. I don't know. I hope so. Praise the Lord. We're all sent, right? We're all sent. We all should be going out. Some of you might be sent to plant a church. Some of you might be sent to go to a foreign field. Some of you might be sent across the street. But we're all sent, right? Amen? This church, First Bible, has many opportunities for you to grow. They're all around us. The, the vision of Acts 1-8, wow, that starts from here in this community and goes all the way around the world. The, the mission of Acts 2, to be able to get involved and go house to house and then come together corporately to learn and to grow as a body of Christ, to go out and to do the same. Wow, it's a wonderful vision. So let me tell you, if you want to know how to follow, guess what? We have here what we call one-to-one -one discipleship. Someone will sit down with you and take you through the Word of God and teach you the basic doctrines and just how to follow Jesus. I can honestly tell you I would not be here today if Steve Lighty and Paul Wolf did not invest in my life, I would not be standing. I wouldn't be here. But that's what it was. I submitted myself into that. You want, you want to learn how to reproduce yourself? There's avenues that we call making disciple makers. It gives you the opportunity to learn what it means of how to reproduce yourself. You want to know how to lead? There's going to be a, an avenue here that's going to be built about to teach you how to lead as a leader, maybe that might touch to your household and to your family or a leader of a small group within the church. Or maybe even how to prepare your life. Well, we have Acts 1-8 Bible Institute. See, the opportunities are here, but the question is, is are you willing to go a little bit further? So as we close up here, church, I'm going to end with this question, how far are you willing to go? Where is God pulling on your heartstrings today? Well, how much... What little step does he want you to take? What direction? The opportunities are here. Jesus placed a high value on mankind and went all the way through the cross, and he's now sitting on the right hand of the Father. He saw the end. Remember, our God has foreknowledge. He saw the end, and you know what he did? He built a plan. He didn't just give up. He saw the end of what's going to happen. He saw you sitting in your seats. He saw all of these children accepting Jesus as their Savior. That is the joy that caused Jesus to endure to and through the cross. So where must we start? Let's start. With, and now this is the neat piece. I'm sorry, I've got to call it out. This is the piece that connects to milk singing. So let's start with the destination. And this verse here that's going to be up on the screen. 
Revelation chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Do you know this is our destination? This is where we're at, church. What Milt sang about is what we're closing with. The destination is taking these incorruptible crowns that we are told to go after and lying down on our face before the Holy One and casting those crowns at His feet because He's the one that's worthy. He's worthy, not us. That's our destination. So we're going to finish with this last question. With that destination, how much value do you place on that moment? How much value do you place upon Revelation chapter 4? Because how much value is going to determine what step you take next? May we run to obtain as Paul the Apostle has asked us to. Amen? Let's everybody stand. And this is a time that you have right now an opportunity because I really feel that, that God is, is moving. I know he's moving in my heart. And I know he's moving in your heart. And we're just going to take the next few minutes to give you the opportunity because at the altar you can spend some time, do some business with him. This is your time to spend with the Lord. And my prayer for you is if he's challenging you to come up and, and maybe talk to one of the pastors about being taught discipleship. Maybe um, talk about going through some training. Maybe taking that step out there on the field, whatever it might be. This is the time right now to make those decisions and go as far as Jesus Christ went for you. Take this time now. Do some work and do some business with your God. is pa